Ah, crimes. What a vast kind of underworld that is hard to control. And you know what makes crimes even more pitiful? Women! Yeah! Now, don't get me wrong. What I'm trying to say is when these graceful ladies wear the criminal clothes and pose threat to societies, then they simply ruin their aura. And in today's video, we are shedding some light on some of the most notorious killer girls to have existed. Fulham Davy. In 1963, 10th of August, she was born in the village of Gorha Kapurva in Jalong district, Uttar Pradesh, India. She was known as the Bandit Queen, an Indian decoy who became a politician until her assassination. Now that is some serious transformation. She was from Mala Subcast, lived in a village with poverty in the state of Uttar Pradesh. She faced many hardships throughout her life. She got married at a very young age and, being sexually abused by a variety of people, joined up with a gang of decoys. Her gang swindled higher caste villages and fleeced trains and vehicles. Fulan Devi was indicted in absentia for the 1981 Bemai massacre, in which 20 Takur men were guillotined allegedly on her command. Eventually, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh resigned and took her into custody. She spent 11 years in Gwalior prison, awaiting trial. In 1994, she was released from all charges and in 1996 became a politician and was elected as a member of parliament for the Samajwadi party until her death. In 2001, she was assassinated outside her house. Her family had a land dispute with her uncle and his son, who had taken it by giving bribes to the village leaders and compelled her family to leave the village. During that hard time, she insisted on getting married to a man who was three times her age and greedy as well to acquire their land by getting signed the land's paper from her. Her parents sent her to a village called Teoga to her relative, and soon she fell in love with her cousin and started living with him. In January 1979, Mayadin, a cousin, destroyed her family's crops and began to chop down a neem tree on their land. When Fulan Davy wounded his face by throwing stones at him, she was arrested by the local police and detained for one month. Mala Sen, the police officer, asked her if she had been raped at the police station. Fulan Davy replied, They had plenty of fun at my expense and beat the hell out of me too. In July 1979, a gang of bandits led by Babu Gujar kidnapped Fulan Devi and raped her repeatedly. Vikram Mala killed the Gujar and trained Devi on how to use rifles. They started robbing vehicles and looted higher caste villages, sometimes impersonating themselves using stolen police uniforms. She was caught by the police on March 31, 1981, and surrendered to the authorities after long negotiations led by trustworthy police officer Rajenda Chaturvedi, with the following conditions regarding her surrender. No death penalty for anyone from her gang, a maximum custodial sentence of eight years, no use of handcuffs, being imprisoned as a group, being imprisoned in Madhya Pradesh and not Uttar Pradesh, her family being given land with space for her goat and cow, and her brother getting a government job. Despite the prior agreement that she would not spend more than eight years in prison, she spent over ten years on remand. Fulan Davis' fame throughout India continued to grow. She was globally famous and has become a legendary figure. Santokban Sarmanbai Jadeja, aka Godmother. She is a very kind, affectionate, quiet, caring, and warm hearted mother who doesn't need any protection, nor does she have a commanding voice. She avoids eye contact, looks down with a smile, and rubs her palms while talking. Educated till third grade, her language was Gujarati, the peculiar dialect in the Katyava region. But she is Santagban Jadeja, the mafia queen of Katyavad, cruel and cold-blooded, and has a gang in the area with 102 hardcore criminals, engaging in systematic murders and kidnappings. A film, The Godmother, was made, in which she indulged in drinking, smoking, and dancing with her courtiers. She wanted that film to be banned, but she was told that this movie has nothing to do with Santokban. The Godmother recalls how she plunged into the world of politics after her husband Sarman Bai Munjan Bai Jadeja, who was an ordinary mill worker but later became gangster and don, murdered by fellow gang leader Jiva Bhai in 1987. The worrying was that Santokban took her own revenge. 
she made a deal with her gang members to assassinate one killer and get a hundred thousand rupees. Almost all 14 people were eliminated. In 1996, her terror was spread everywhere, with no one to challenge. Santokban indicted for murder in Ahmedabad jail for 16 months with her four children. But she never liked to involve them in any case. Rather, she used to say, I don't want my family members to enter this line. A person like me is enough. In the late 80s and early 90s, 525 criminal cases were filed against her gang, according to the police. Her gang consisted of a hundred men and she was booked in countless murders. She served as a member of Legislative Assembly from Kutiyana from 1990 to 1995 as a Janata Dal and was close to Chiman by Patel. She died of a heart attack on March 31, 2011. Seema Parihar Now, let's go back to India again and let me take you through the somewhat mysterious life of Seema Parihar, who was born on January 1, 1970, in a poor family in Oreya, Uttar Pradesh, India. When she was just three years old, she was kidnapped by some decoys from her village and raised by them. Later, she got married to two different decoys, nearby Singh Gujar and Lala Ram. During her time with the decoys, she was involved in some serious crimes like killing people, kidnapping, and robbing houses in the Bihan jungle and around the Chambal river area. When she turned 18 in June 2000, she decided to surrender to the Uttar Pradesh police. She was charged with many crimes, including murder and kidnapping. Eventually, she got involved in politics and joined different political parties like the Indian Justice Party, Lok Jan Shakti Party and Samajwadi Party. In October 2008, she was cleared of some criminal cases but still had to deal with others. Her lawyer said she would appeal to the High Court for the remaining cases. After serving her sentence, Seema Parihar became known as a social activist. She spoke out for women's rights, education, and helping former criminals reintegrate into society. In 2011, she was chosen to lead the women's wing of the National Corruption Eradication Council, which fights against corruption. Seema Parihar's life story has been told in the media, books, and even in a Bollywood movie called Wounded the Bandit Queen, where she played herself. Griselda Blanco, aka La Dama de la Mafia, the Lady of the Mafia. Okay, grab your tickets, because now we're flying all the way from India to Colombia. Born on February 15, 1943, in Cartagena, Colombia, Blanco had become a pickpocket before she was a teenager, and then became a thief and prostitute at the age of 19 and 20. Blanco's lover, Charles Cosby, said that at the age of 11, she murdered a child for ransom after kidnapping. Blanco was one of America's highest-earning drug traffickers in the 70s and 80s. She went by many nicknames – La Madrina, The Black Widow, and La Dama de la Mafia. She established the cocaine trade among Colombia, Miami, New York, and California, and earned $80 million per month. In 1964, after divorcing her first husband, Trujillo, Blanco illegally started living with her husband, Alberto Bravo, a cocaine smuggler, and with her three children in New York. In 1975, after being pinned down by the authorities and accused with the charge, she started a new drug business in Miami. On February 17, 1985, she was apprehended by DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, and incarcerated for 15 years imprisonment. In Florida, she was also charged with first-degree murders and in 1998, she was again charged with a second-degree murder and was put in jail for 20 years. In 2004, after only six years of imprisonment, she was deported to Colombia. Blanco, who was known as Colombia's Queen of Cocaine at the age of 69, was gunned down by two bullets in the northwestern city of Medellin when she was leaving a butcher's shop. Maria Licciardi Maria Licciardi's life journey began in Naples, Italy, on April 1, 1951, where she was born into a family struggling with poverty. A very ordinary start, hinting at nothing sinister right now, right? Well, keep watching. Growing up in a tough neighborhood, she faced numerous hardships from an early age. Despite the challenges, Maria found herself drawn into the criminal underworld, ultimately becoming entangled with the notorious Camorra gang. 
And this is where things took the wrong turn. As she matured into her 20s, Maria's influence with the Camorra grew exponentially. Known for her cunning and ruthlessness, she swiftly ascended the ranks, spearheading various illegal ventures including drug trafficking, extortion, and orchestrating violent acts. However, Maria's criminal activities did not go unnoticed by law enforcement, because you know what they say is true – the earth is round. In 2001, Italian authorities apprehended her, bringing an end to her reign of crime. Subsequently, she faced a slew of charges and was sentenced to imprisonment. Even behind bars, Maria's presence loomed large, maintaining her grip on the criminal network. Despite her incarceration, Maria's legacy endured, her name synonymous with the dark underbelly of organized crime. Post-release, she attempted to distance herself from criminal past, striving to rebuild her life within the confines of the law. Maria's captivating story has not only gripped the public's imagination, but has also been extensively covered in various media platforms and literature. Her narrative serves as a poignant reminder of the perilous paths treaded by those ensnared in the clutches of organized crime and the enduring consequences that follow. Eileen Warnos Eileen Warnos' criminal past was marked by a turbulent upbringing fraught with hardship and trauma. Born in 1956 in Michigan, she faced abuse and neglect from a young age. By her teenage years, Wuornos was living on the streets, turning to sex work as a means of survival. Her descent into violence began in the late 1980s, when she embarked on a killing spree that spanned over a year. Targeting men she encountered while working as a prostitute, Wuornos claimed that her actions were acts of self-defense against those who had assaulted or threatened her. The gruesome nature of her crimes, combined with the uncommon spectacle of a female serial killer, captured the public's imagination and instilled widespread fear. The unpredictability of her attacks, coupled with the notion that anyone could be her next victim, sent shockwaves throughout communities, both in America and abroad. Following her arrest and subsequent conviction, Werno's story continued to captivate audiences, prompting debates about mental health, societal neglect, and the nature of criminality. Even in death, she reminds a haunting figure in criminal lore. Her legacy serves as a grim reminder of the complexities of human behavior and the enduring allure of true crime narratives. Beverly Allett Beverly Allett, known as the Angel of Death, sent shivers down the spines of people in the early 1990s in England. She was a nurse who worked in a hospital, a place of healing and trust, but behind her angelic facade lurked a sinister truth. Allett's crimes unfolded at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire, where she worked as a nurse. Over a period of just a few months, in 1991, she committed a series of heinous acts. Alec murdered four innocent children and attempted to kill nine others by injecting them with lethal doses of insulin and other substances. The chilling aspect of Alec's crimes was the betrayal of trust. Patients and their families placed their faith in her, believing she was there to care for them. Instead, she preyed upon the vulnerable, causing unimaginable pain and suffering. The fear surrounding Alec's actions was profound. Parents worried about the safety of their children in hospitals, while the medical community grappled with the breach of trust and the implications for patient care. After her arrest and conviction, Alice's story continued to haunt the public consciousness. Her case raised questions about mental health, patient safety, and the responsibilities of those entrusted with caregiving roles. Beverly Allett serves as a chilling reminder of the darkness that can reside within seemingly ordinary individuals, casting a long shadow over the world of healthcare and beyond. And before we exchange goodbyes, all I would like to say is that these are prime examples of those women who ruined their lives with their own hands. So always use the power of deciding for yourselves wisely, or at some point in life, you may end up falling into a list of criminals on another YouTube video. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Until then.